Welcome to Counterpoint. I'm Tanya Granick Allen. Are you ready to pop some bubbly? Say goodbye to 2021 and all that was this past year? So before we jump head first into 2022, let's take pause and review some of the stories which grabbed the headlines this year. Stories which shocked, surprised, comforted, and made us cry. And joining me to go through the news is Nathaniel Duick, Forum Daily Bureau Chief here at the News Forum. Nathaniel, thank you so much for joining me today here in studio. My pleasure to be here, Tanya. Yes, you didn't have to go very far to join me, did you? <laughs> no, no. Always a pleasure to join you here today. Okay, though. excellent. Well, Especially I really... at the year-end show, which I would love. Yes, we did this last year, and I really enjoyed it because things are happening so qu- in some ways so quickly, in some ways very slowly. Like COVID never seems to end, but there is a lot of things happening in the world and in Canada that we need to kind of remember, recall, and remind our viewers. Yeah, I, I mean, I think... Without a doubt, the story of the year, in fact, the Canadian press story of the year, was the um, unmarked graves at residential schools across this country. I don't think that there was anything more significant for, for many viewers and for many Canadians as that event was this year. Yes, or the the announcement. Uh, in fact, it wasn't even the announcement. It was the reawakening of the knowledge of Canadian history. And yeah, and that's and that's not to cut you off. But no, no, like, go that for is it. that's exactly the thing. I think a lot of people found that this was someone, uh, one of the editors uh, of one of the um, surveys for the Canadian press said, uh, you know, it took some of the Canadianness out of Canada. I, I think it took some of the complacency or, or some of the, the willful blinders that we had put on uh, as, as a general public. Of course, amongst Indigenous communities, there was always a knowing. Um, but this, I think, brought to the forefront that these are children who are taken from their homes um, right. stripped of their culture and their language right. and, and forced into an institution that really didn't care about them at all. And, and we are, unfortunately, we are bound by that as can, uh, Canadians. Well, and, and so growing up actually was in my own family home that I learned about what happened to Indigenous children that in, in some cases they were forcibly removed uh, under government programs from their home and again, you know, stripped of the culture, um, their their creed, et cetera. Um, so for me, when this discovery, if you will, of these uh, of these graves that, of course, had always been there, mm-hmm. kind of surfaced, and everybody was like surprised and, and shocked and horror. I, I was more concerned. I was surprised actually that, that people didn't know enough about their history. I'm like, didn't you learn about this? And I think I think that has prompted a lot of provinces to consider. You know, well, at least a lot of parents to petition that more of this be included, a lot of individuals around Canada to say this is something that is, uh, that is important that we teach. But at the same time, I think there's a lot of, there was a lot of, when it first started coming out, a lot of hesitation amongst Canadians. We're saying, this isn't us. This isn't what we do. And yet, like you said, learning from our history, we are actually learning about this um, or re-engaging with it, I think, on more than just a a theoretical abstract concept, but seeing uh, actual physical indications of, of this actually being something that people are affected by. Uh, these are people, right. right? These are kids. In fact, the newsmaker of the year for the Canadian press were children who did not return from residential schools. And I think that that is entirely uh, poignant and, and a correct way to view it is that these they did make their... That's, that's what focuses the human aspect on this charitable, uh, institutional um, evil. Well... You know, for me, the biggest takeaway, and and I've I've spoken about this issue many, many times in the past, is it always comes down to parental rights. Don't interfere with the family. Parents get the final say over their kids. This was yet another example, a very major, uh, probably the biggest example of of, of parental rights violation. And uh, and not just we don't want to whitewash history, right? No. Canada has a very spotted history, and I'm not here to you know this is our year end special, right. and I'm not here to you know go through all the black marks. Every country has them. But people need to just take the willful blinders off, as you said, and say, here's yet another example of where wrong was done and how can we do it better. And to, to rectify wrong, you need to recognize that wrong is being done, right? You know, we need to accept that this is what we did. It is not who we want to be. It's not uh, who we necessarily even are intentionally anymore. But we are also a country where we have many instances of unintentional um, yes. uh, racism or, or acts that, that preclude one one culture, especially right. when it comes to Indigenous people. Well, and it's, it still carries on. Let's pivot for uh, a moment. Some of the these unmarked graves were, were in British Columbia. I want to pivot to British Columbia. There was a lot happening in British Columbia this year. Flames and floods, BC. 
It was like something out of biblical. It was absolutely. Um, it dominated news waves for sure, and and it continues to. Uh, I mean, uh, the the fires, the village of Lytton, and of course, uh, you know, flooding right now, Abbotsford, and 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 they're still working on getting out of that. Okay, I'm going to pause so, you there. Yeah. We've got to go to commercial break, and we'll be right back with Nathaniel Duick in just a few moments. Welcome back. We're doing a year in review of all the headlines and major stories that have hit our desk this year. And joining me is Nathaniel Duick, uh, Bureau Chief here for Forum Daily at the News Forum. Nathaniel, we were talking about British Columbia, the, the town of Lytton, BC, uh, engulfed in flames, pretty much gone, sections yeah. of it, yeah. at least most of it. Uh, what about the floods? So we had fires and then we had floods and the lower mainland of British Columbia mm. was, was just... Hit. Devastated, I think Devastated. is the right word. You know, you're, you're seeing entire highways washed away, and I think the emergency crews in BC is doing a phenomenal job of, of getting that back into operation. But let's not pretend that this won't impact um, daily life down in southern BC for, for some time. Well, we had gas rations, we had grocery rations, obviously supply chain disruptions that impacts the rest of Canada. Yeah. Um, what else did we have? We had um, obviously infrastructure that has to be rebuilt. Also agriculture, this is gonna impact the growing season. Don't forget, they have a very extended growing season. Yeah, not just that, I think uh, close to around 420 cows according to the BC uh, Dairy, Dairy Farmers Association last I saw were killed in this flooding. So okay. that and thousands of chickens as well as uh, some other livestock as well. So let's not, you know, th there's a there's an infrastructure aspect, but there's also, uh, you know, agriculture was hit hard. And as well, you know, we've had hay shortages across the country as well. Not just the fires, but right. we had the heat dome, of course, in, in BC as well. Um, but, the, but the shorter growing season or the hotter growing season, in some cases a drought, severe drought, um, has led to a great deal of issues there. Yes, and a lot of these issues seem to have been brought on by COVID. I'm talking about the supply chain, mm. which yes, uh, the fires and the flooding in BC also impacted, but supply chain was an issue. Uh, COVID brought up a lot of issues, and and I, I don't want to negate that big on this topic. I do so many shows on it, so I don't want to dwell too, too much on COVID, but we saw the, um, the advent of, of vaccine passports, of uh, mandatory vaccinations, you can't go places. You can, now we can't board a plane. We cannot go on a train unless you show proof of two, maybe soon to be three doses of some vaccine, not certain ones, and some yes, some no. Well, you know, I think at the end of the day, it's uh, in some ways. I think, um, of course, this has been a, a tremendous issue for a lot of people, and a lot of people are very concerned about it. At the same time, you're seeing this is one of the the steps that are being taken in order to try to make sure that everybody, as, as much as we can, get back to, uh, to what was quote unquote regular or normal life before. So, you know, these are, these are steps that are being taken and, and we'll see, of course, uh, how it develops as we go on. And uh, yeah, so yes, you're right. Absolutely, vaccine passports came in um, fairly widely, not just across Canada, across the world. And when many premiers said they wouldn't do them, like I remember Jason Kenney, I think even maybe Doug Ford said he would never bring in vaccine passports, conservatives, and yet here they are. And there are court challenges, you know, decrying the the violations of, of freedoms and our charter rights on these. You know, I mean, uh, yeah, that there's uh, there's some strong evidence of that. However, there's also you know the court rulings that say the governments when they're acting in, uh, for public health and public benefit can rule on these things. So, so I don't. I I'm going to make a prediction, and I maybe I'm a cynical, <laughs> depressed person, but uh, I don't think anything's going to happen with vaccine pass passports. I think they're going to stay, and I think they're only going to increase. I mean, when you go to the to the liquor store or anything, you have to show your ID to you know for proof of purchase. So in some ways, maybe it's just a variation on that theme. Yeah, so I'm not going to agree with that. <laughs> I think it's a huge <laughs> violation, not variation. Okay, that aside, violation, not variation. Oh, okay. It was All a right. violation, not a well, variation. Well, we'll have to thing. disagree on the the violation. Yes, I would like to see the passports go because I don't like that. Mm. But anyhow, let's shift. Pastors in jail. I never thought, as a daughter of immigrants, uh, my husband, father escaping communism, that I would live in Canada and see religious leaders be jailed. And yet here we are in 2021, 20, uh, we saw it for the first time. Well, I mean, I think viewers are probably likely aware of these stories, um, and, and so I won't get into the recapping of it, but I, I think there's a clear case of, uh, there is, uh, it isn't as cut and dry as pastors being in prison. There is rules or laws that were made and rules that were being broken willfully, repeatedly. And when you break the law repeatedly, typically there's a consequence. And so that is just the rule of law acting in place. That would be that would be the way I so think. So I, I see it as more this has now reopened the discussion or the understanding of what the separation 
from church and state means? Is mm. it to protect the church from the state or protect the state from the church? And I'm pretty sure it was the, the former, not the latter. Well, I mean, there, there, is, there is that aspect. I still see it as there are those who follow the rules who have, and those who don't follow the rules who are warned, who continue on with their practices against, against the rules or the law, and then they are punished for it. And, so. But what if the rules are unjust? Well, now we're in philosophy, aren't we? We are, and, and, that, and we'll leave that for the courts to decide. Okay, there's so many more uh, topics we have to get through. Um, uh, okay, in terms of pastors' jail, we're, we, we talked about that. We have so much more. Uh, I want to talk about the federal election when we come back from break. We have to talk about the two Michaels. There's so many more things. Yes. So if you stick around, we will be with you with so many more topics in just a few moments. Welcome back. We're doing our annual year in review with all the major news headlines and events that took place in Canada and abroad. And joining me again is Nathaniel Duek, the Daily Forum Bureau Chief here at the News Forum. Forum Daily, I should say, not Daily Forum. Forum Daily with it's Nima Forum Rajan. Daily with Nima Rajan every night. Federal election. Okay, we started... Well, it was really, we started hearing the rumblings of a federal election all year, but they started really to heat up in, in June as we broke for summer and then... We went to the polls in September. Was that the right call for Prime Minister Trudeau? What was gained? What was lost? Well, I think you can say two seats were gained. So there is that. <laughs> two um, seats were gained. Whether that was or was not uh, he, what he was expecting uh, and the party was expecting, we will uh, have to leave up to them. But it wouldn't seem to be if I were calling an election, which I'm not. So, Well, I guess one of the pros for himself or Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister Trudeau, calling an election is that he sort of reset the two-year clock because with a minority... Two years is what you get. Majority, you get around four or five. Yeah, you know, I, I've heard a lot of commentary on that two-year mark, but this seems to be, from my understanding of it, it seems to be a quite a durable-looking coalition. Uh, you know, the, as long as he can keep the NDP more or less happy, and uh, that should work. In cases where that doesn't, you know, he can he can leverage a little bit of Quebec support uh, and and get the bloc on side. So I'm not so sure if this is a strict two-year. Yeah. mandate, um, but maybe the government will be tired after two years. Politics, I'm sure, is a tiring sport. And how hard is it really for Prime Minister Trudeau to keep the NDP happy? So many times he seems to outflank the left. Well, I, you know, I don't know if necessarily the NDP say that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, that seems to be the way a lot of commentary is going as well. Now, um, Aaron O'Toole, since the election, okay, so we saw Anime Paul left yeah. as leader. Aaron O'Toole, there's a a potential challenge for his leadership from the grassroots. Will it go anywhere? I don't know. Uh, we'll have to see. Maybe we'll see a replacement with um, with uh, Mr. Singh as head of the of the NDP. So we could see a lot of leaderships this year. Wow, that would be a bold move for the NDP to get rid of uh, one of their most popular leaders. So well, I, I think... don't know. Um, but the, let's go back to to the point. I think you're, you're talking there a bit about grassroots and enemy Paul. You're seeing two different party styles, mm -hmm. if you will, of internal governance. Right? And so on the, on the conservative side, they say they're grassroots and driven by the membership. And so these, these groups have power. And, and the green side, the federal council had a lot of power and was seen to put up a lot of blocks against, um, against, uh, against uh, the leader at the time, Enemy Paul. Now, of course, what's interesting to me as I think about it is what, what does this mean for the power of caucus or individual MPs within their party? So that is my question. Well, apparently not that much, <laughs> considering uh, C4, the conversion therapy ban bill, was passed with unanimous consent in the Senate and in the House, with not one MP speaking up and saying nay. So apparently it means nothing. <laughs> well, unless, unless everybody was more or less seized of the importance of, you know, uh, making sure that equal rights for all Canadians are, are upheld, um, if, if, and if that was the understanding of the bill, then it proceeded to pass and... With, uh, with flying colors. Well, apparently we've had some people tweet out now that, oh, we regret voting that way. I said, well, to me, that's a little too little, too late. Woulda, well, shoulda, coulda, right? Woulda, shoulda, coulda, that's... Yeah. Okay, another issue that I thought would feature more prominently in the federal election towards the tail end when this was sort of erupting was Afghanistan, but it didn't. And it was a huge thing at, for a while, and then now it's kind of gone by the wayside. What's happening in Afghanistan? I mean, to me, Afghanistan is still one of the most uh, tragic stories that, uh, that we have we've had in, in Canadian recent history. Um, whether we should or shouldn't have gotten out of there isn't necessarily the question that I'm looking at. It's the manner in which we left so abruptly, so quickly. The U.S. left and everybody else immediately also left. And uh, the, uh, the ANA, the Afghan National Army, 
um, did not hold out or, or, or resist as long as, as some analysts expected. Again, some did. Right. Some were, uh, were suggesting it. Bill Roggio at Forum uh, uh, or uh, Foundation for Defense of Democracies was long predicting that this was going to be something. But all that to say, um, I think that Afghanistan indicates something uh, in 2021 of a bit of the decline of Western or belief in Western credibility. Wow, yes. And do you think that is apropos with Joe Biden because Biden is a president? No. I mean, if you look at it, uh, the Trump administration did something very similar with the Kurds. They right. abandoned them and, and the shelling and massacre in Afrin um, uh, continued on with, with, with civilians there as well. So between, between that, then you have back to the COVID-19 vaccine rollout, you have Western countries basically pillaging or taking the lion's share of, of vaccines from uh, that which was meant for for uh, developing countries uh, through the COVAX initiative or just hoarding them themselves, and we're getting boosters now. And the third thing, which I'll add quickly, is um, going to COP, uh, COP, the COP conference and seeing how Western countries, despite saying climate change is a priority, did not really follow up with any bang for okay, buck well, look, on that. You're opening up a, a huge can of worms with COP because I have some strong feelings on that. But um, just hold that thought. We'll be right back after this commercial break. Welcome back, wrapping up our discussion on the latest and greatest headlines of 2021 before we head into 2022. Joining me, Nathaniel Duick. Nathaniel, you know, we were talking about Afghanistan and, and you threw in a lot of topics there, so I want to no. kind of unpack them in a little way. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's important to note, though, Canada actually withdrew from Afghanistan several years before America. So we kind of already said, you know what, we're done here. Uh, so maybe that's why it wasn't as much of an election issue as we thought it might be, because it wasn't we weren't as close to the heat, if you will. Do you think Afghanistan has any hope of becoming a democracy or was just never in the cards? I mean, whether a country becomes or is a, democ a democracy or it becomes or more or less democratic, you know, this is, there's, a, I'm sure, a varying degree of different uh, perspectives. But I think in this case, what we what happened in Afghanistan was particularly tragic because not only did the Western countries, which were largely since 2014, more or less just performing a presence there, Correct. and the presence was, was enough to keep the, the Taliban away, but we also, when we left, we took some of the, the best and brightest minds, and we we're still continuing to extract them out of Afghanistan. So not only did we leave the country, uh, lock it out of all of its uh, foreign aid and humanitarian funding, and it's going into a drought now, mm. but... We also took some of the brightest minds, the hope, if you will, of the future. That's actually a very interesting point, and seldom it's covered. So I appreciate that you brought that up. Um, but what does one expect? Uh, even Canada has brain drain. We all have brain drain when things change and pivot. Obviously, Afghanistan is far more serious. Uh, what do they expect? That women who were in universities would stay under the Taliban rule at the threat of what? Go home and you're not going to be allowed in school anymore? And um, there's been mixed messages coming out of the Taliban, of course. So, I mean, you know, whether this inst institution, whether this whether this group has changed or not, you know, there's horrifying stories that you've read from the past. So I, I don't know. Uh, that's something to, we'll all be watching. Right. Yeah. Let's, let's pivot to another tyrannical situation, Cuba. Uh, we've seen uh, in, in a great way, an uprising for democracy. It's always been there, but every once in a while, you get these strong waves of, of a stronger, more coalesced uh, call for freedom. And we've seen that in, in, in Cuba with, with the, the protests. Now we have young people in jail. Obviously, to sit in a jail in a communist country is, is a horrible situation. We can only imagine the, the, the torture and the conditions that exist in that. Do you think 2022 will be a year in which Cuba will be free? Wow, can well, you imagine that? I, I mean, that's a that's a big question, and that's a lot of a lot of analysis They're into that. They're thirsting I think, for that freedom. You know, this is um. I think what I can't say is we are seeing a lot of changes around the world, right? And I think there'll be a lot of shifts in the status quo, and we're seeing it all the time. But uh, you did mention um, people sitting in, in in communist prison cells, and I think we have to be thankful here at the end of the year in 2021 that uh, the two Michaels, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver are finally back home. Absolutely. I almost forgot about that. The two Michaels, it happened so suddenly, but it was such a huge deal. And, 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 and thankfully so that they're back. But how does that change things for Canada and China? Well, and this is, this is my question too. And this is, I think, the question that a lot of people are asking. What has fundamentally changed by getting them in? Was, were they released because of, of Canadian action? Or was this because the U.S. 
and and the Chinese government agreed to a deal that saw Meng Wanzhou um, right. be, be free, or is this more about, um, or were we just kind of, were we on the sidelines? Who won, right? But, uh, for sure the two Michaels, I mean, they need to be home, but did, yeah. did Canada win or did China win? Well, I think going forward, did we, did we gain any, did we demonstrate here in Canada that we have any leverage with the uh, Chinese government? I find it. I find nothing to say that would indicate it. So, right. Despite well, let's see this what being... happens in the in the Beijing Olympics. Don't forget that we have the Winter Olympics right, coming up in just a, a few well. weeks. So, we'll see what that diplomatic boycott really uh, distills to. Um, Trump Biden. We only have a minute left. We're going to be very quick. Trump's out. Biden's in. That happened this year. It seems like so long ago. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think another thing is. Um... The, the change in administrations and seeing right now the, uh, of course, the ongoing rift around um, protectionism and in particular in EV uh, tax credits or, or rebates right. for Americans that could uh, ultimately have a very detrimental impact on the Canadian auto industry. Right. So lots right. to keep in mind for internationally, a lot going on. Yeah, a lot of shows to talk about. I want to finish mm. off with notable Canadians who passed away. We only have 30 seconds. Alex Trebek, right? What a the, Canadian hero. The voice of Jeopardy himself. Uh, Norm Macdonald, this was a, 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 there was a big response to his passing south of the border because of his contribution to comedy, mm -hmm. SNL. Mm -hmm. And then for me, this was a big one, Christopher Plummer, mm. great Canadian acting icon. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was so sad to hear about that, but that's life, right? That's life. That's life. Well, listen, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me today, Nathaniel, and we'll wish you all the best for 2022.